This video covers the actual construction of the charge monitor project. And by the way, this is covered under a Creative Commons 4.0 license, which means that if you're a private individual, you can build it, you can share it, you can modify it, you can share it with others. But if you're a commercial entity, you cannot. Because I don't want cheapskate RV companies from stealing this design and adapting it to some of their other things like their tank monitors. And I received my front panel, which is this. I actually built a back panel as well. And I'll show you how that goes together. But this is what will hold the uh, panel in place. Now I did make a mistake. And this is four millimeters thick because what I originally was going to do is I was going to have a lip cut on the back side and it was going to be two millimeter on the outside and two millimeter on the inside so when it fit it wouldn't have a chance to do this. But that added about ten dollars to the project so I decided not to put the lip in and then I forgot to reduce this from four millimeters to two millimeters so it came with a pretty thick piece. And if you want to build one of these, I've since gone back into the front panel and reduced this thickness to 2 millimeters. And also, this is the raw machined edge. And this is the way that these little panels come. And you can take a little black Sharpie, or I'm going to use a little paint pen and just paint the edge black uh, when we get ready to install it. And here is the circuit board. We have to do a small modification to the circuit board. And the reason I didn't have the factory do it is because they could not do that. What we have to do is on the back side, we have to put some countersinks, and they didn't have a procedure to do the countersink. So what we have is we just have a little manual countersink here, and I'm going to do it by hand on the back side of the board. This is the front side with all the lettering. If we flip it over on the back side, we want to take our countersink and put the countersink in here and start turning it. And you could use a drill, but it'll get away from you maybe real quick. So it's a lot easier just to do it by hand. So that's, I'm going to just take and cut a countersink on the top and bottom. So now I've installed all four of the LEDs on the back side and four resistors that are the current limiting resistors for the LEDs plus two more resistors required for the board operation. Now normally with these LEDs you would use something like a 470 ohm resistor to limit the current. However, these LEDs all have a slightly different brightness. Part of that is just the inherent efficiency of each color. The other part is your eye sensitivity to different colors. I intensity matched these LEDs, and so I actually used a different value resistor for each LED. I tried this with several different brands of LEDs, so you really need to go onto my website, and I'll tell you what values that I used for the particular LEDs that I used. And you don't have to do that. You can use 470 ohms for every one of them. But what you'll find is one LED will be brighter than the other. And now I have the capacitors in. And on these two, these are electrolytic capacitors. And they're polarized. And there's a minus stripe on this side of each capacitor. These two capacitors are not polarized and they can go in either way. And next is the socket for the AT1085, which is right here. And there is a dimple on this surface. And that should line up to that little round circle there. Or when you look at it with a silk screen, the dimple should go down when the lettering is correct. Now we could have soldered the AT85 straight to the board, but that would prevent us from removing it if we ever need to make any programming changes. And you'd probably destroy it trying to get it out of the board. And next is the voltage regulator, the 78L05, which is here. And there's a flat spot on this side, and it corresponds with a flat spot on the board. And then there's a zener diode here with a copper side here and a black stripe on this side. And there's a stripe on the silk screen on the board, but the black stripe should go towards the back. There's really no proper way or wrong way to install these components. But typically I like to do the resistors first and the parts that are closest to the board and saving the semiconductors for last. And now we have the tremor potentiometer in here and as well as the header. Now this potentiometer is a 10 turn potentiometer and it uses a low screwdriver and you can turn it 10 turns one way or the other. And this is what we're going to use to calibrate the board so that a certain function happens at a certain voltage. The last thing we have to do is program this ATtiny85 with the battery monitor program. 
and there's a separate video on that because that's a little involved and there is a little dot on here that corresponds with that dimple and dot here and then you just push it down like that and now the board is completely assembled I had intended to provide a little more detail on this next step because it is a little bit hard to maybe visualize but the problem is my camera didn't focus right and I didn't realize it and we have two little brackets here and the brackets are secured to the board by the countersinks that we made and then they're secured to the front panel with uh, hardware sticking through here that's also countersink from the front and you have to put those in first before you can put these switches on because these switches mount to the bottom side of the board and here is the drawing and hopefully you can tell a little bit what I've done here's a printed circuit board in green this is the front panel in gray and then we've got these Keystone 621 brackets which are commercially available and the brackets have 440 threads on both surfaces. This screw is from the front and secures this bracket to the back side of the front. This screw, which is where the countersink is in the board, comes down and it secures the board. And one thing you have to be mindful of is this bracket's not the same length. On the board side, the bracket is a slightly shorter than on the front side. And if you look at the dimensions here, if you get this bracket backwards, then when you try to put the switches in, the switches will not align with the holes. So what you want to do is you want to put this bracket on first, get it nice and secure. Then when you put the switches in, you may have to hold the switches up or down or a little bit to get them centered in the holes and then solder them in. And you can just see the heads, the flat heads of the screws underneath the switches. So you have to install the board first and then you solder the switches to the board. And once you install the switches it's difficult to get these out if not impossible. So that's why I can't really take this apart and kind of show you how I did it. And so between what I show here and the drawing you should be able to see a little bit better idea how these go in. And the reason I put the switches on the bottom is I don't have a lot of space to work with here on the front. So that's how I got everything to go together. And the other thing that I try to cover is the LEDs here, along here, are just press fit into the front. And you just bend them over to the side, push them in. And they don't go in quite all the way, but they go in enough that they will actually hold quite well. And before we can use this, we're going to have to calibrate it. To calibrate it, we have to set a known voltage on here and then turn this potentiometer until the display is the reading that we want it to be. Now to do that, you're gonna to have to have a variable power supply. The procedure is setting the power supply up to exactly 12.75 volts. 12.75 volts, that's about the middle of the operation range of the voltages this is going to detect. So once you get it set to 12.75 volts, you take your screwdriver. As you turn it, it seems like it overshoots each way a little bit. And the reason it seems like it overlaps is because it actually takes about a second between readings. So what you really want to do is adjust this in very small increments. Now if you do not have a variable power supply, go to my website and I have a table that shows the different voltages and what the reading on this test point should be. Now there's a test point right here. It says Cal JP2 and it's between the 801085 and his resistor. It's a little copper pad with nothing on it. And you basically set your meter there. And of course, you want to put the negative side of the meter onto the negative side. So you want to go from here to here like that. And depending on what your input voltage is, look at the chart. It'll tell you what that voltage on that point should be. And then you adjust this to be to that voltage. And when you assemble this into the RV, this is going to go in from the front where the switch cavity is and then so this goes in the front this goes in from the back side then you put a couple nuts in here this actually just clamps itself down to the back side of the panel 